Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. Uh, we're back with uh, Jason, and we're back with uh, one of our favorite guests, Benito Serena. Hello, Benito. Hello. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, yeah, no, we're we're, we're super hyped to talk to you about uh, your your new edition of uh, Jeffrey of Monmouth, the King of Britain, the lineage and legacy of Arthur. So uh, before we, we dive into the text and uh, your translation of, and people can read this on your, uh, we'll do the commercial right away because, you know, people are going to want to devour this text uh, after they we're done uh, talking about it so that they can get it on your Patreon, right? Uh, yeah, currently it's available on my Patreon. I'm hoping... Uh within the next year to have a print edition available that you can buy uh, on Amazon or whatever. It'll probably be just like a, a print on demand thing. But for right now, yeah, uh, the Pat Patreon is the way to get it. I have a, a, a PDF available um, of the entire, of the entire text and uh, yeah, $5 and you get, you get that plus access to everything else, uh, you know, in my archives. So yeah, yeah. You got a lot going on on your Patreon. So, um, yeah, I update a lot, <laughs> um, maybe too much. I don't, I don't know. I, I try to give people a value for their money. So, um, yeah, I, I update, yeah, several times a week at the different levels. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, that's Patreon. I mean, what, and, yeah. Benito Torino. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So before getting into this text. You know, Jason and I were talking about before the show, you know, what does this have to do with Gnosticism? And uh, I, I would say you know, not that much, but here we go, right? Which is the Arthurian mythos becomes very important for the, the Gnostic revivalists of, of the 19th century and the early 20th century. And and there are some um, reputable scholars, uh, not just kooks, who think that some of the Arthurian romances, some of the early Arthurian texts do, do have Gnostic themes. Uh, this is probably not one of them, but this is this is a really fun text. Uh, I, I really love it. I've always loved it, and I particularly love uh, Benito's new translation. But we, we got to start off with, what the heck is this? Hey, Benito, who was Geoffrey of Monmouth? What is the Kings of Britain and the, the lineage and legacy of Arthur? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth is a, uh, he's an author from the 12th century um 12th century Britain. He 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 gets his name because he was living and writing in Monmouth in Wales, but he's probably not uh, Welsh uh, ethnically. He's probably he's probably a Norman. Um, but uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, so yeah, he lived he lived in Wales. Probably not Welsh Welsh, but uh, yeah, he was writing. Um, this is a major work of British historiography. Um, he's taking, uh, he, th he thought that there was a, a, a lack. He was looking at what was available in terms of history of uh, the island of Britain. And he could see people like uh, Gildas and Ninius who were writing, they only get so far, right? And he, he was like, well, I need somebody, I, there needs to be a work that brings us up to the end of the British kings, British in the sense of, of uh Britannic stock right before the angles the anglo-saxons um take over because i mean he stops in like the uh you know around the sixth century and so you know someone who's not familiar with the distinction between uh british and english might go well there's still british kings now why doesn't it go up to you know charles the third and it's like well charles the third's not a british king he's an english king um and uh, so he, he writes from the foundation of Britain um, until uh, the last of the Britonic uh, kings um, before the before the Anglo-Saxons uh, officially take over, and, which was kind of was a, a long and ongoing process. But um, yeah, so the text is originally called the um, the Historia Regum Britanniae, the history or the story of the kings of Britain. Um, my version, I called uh, the Kings of Britain, uh, the lineage and legacy of Arthur, just to give people an idea and make clear the um, the Arthurian connection, right? Because it's not entirely about Arthur, but uh, the plurality of the text is about Arthur, right? It's it's a um, eleven book text, and he starts way back with the fall of Troy, right? He starts with the fall of Troy, and then he goes through, um, you know, like the sixth. Uh, 7th century CE and so he's covering literally thousands of years of material uh, but some kings are 
only listed by name uh, with none of their deeds or anything mentioned. Some get more amplified uh, legends. Some get focused on more. Arthur gets more than anybody. And while this text is not the first uh, text to include um, stories of King Arthur, it's the first really extended one where he's the primary central focus. Um, you can see Arthur um, mentioned in, uh, well, I mentioned uh, Gildas, Bede, Nennius. These guys mention him a little bit. Uh, Welsh stories um, like the Killock and, uh, and Olwen story um, feature Arthur and his knights as characters, um, but they're not the central characters and he's not quite the developed um, king of the Britons that he becomes uh, in Geoffrey. And so, uh, so this text... Um, has the like the f yeah the first like extended detailed um account of the life of arthur that ma truly making him the king of the britons rather than just a warlord like he is in some of the other texts and um introducing a, a lot of the elements um that we associate with arthur today um not all of them because there's definitely a lot of things people expect to see and so it's a, a thing that i thought was really interesting to present this text to people was to see you know how does it confound their expectations in terms of what is there already in this early text and what's not there yet, you know? Um, so I think it's really interesting that way, but yeah, like I said, there's, it, it's an, like, it's an 11 book, uh, text is divided into 11 books. And then like the last, I want to say the last three maybe are devoted to Arthur. And then a whole separate one is, uh, Merlin stuff. So, um, it actually, uh, Jeffrey, this this project for Jeffrey uh, grew out of his work on uh, Merlin. He was beginning um, with a text called The Prophecies of Merlin, which are then integrated into this text as book hmm. seven, I want to say. Um, and that was an extremely popular text in the Middle Ages, and it was taken very seriously um, as prophecy. And um, so he, he was doing that first and he was request it basically um his patrons in the church uh requested that he expand that into a complete history of of britain and that's that's what he did yeah Ooh. yeah it, it, it's hard to stress ju just how important this text is like you know we probably wouldn't have the arthur Miso mythos without it it was a really popular text um and like benito was saying like y you know you have a, a sense that arthur is important but really you just have passing references to him and, and stuff like like bead right it's like literally like a couple lines and yeah. then you know you might be shocked because you, uh, when you when you go and read some of the, these welsh romances these these welsh stories that are ancient and very elaborate and very mythological but again you know arthur's very much a secondary character so we don't get you know anything else about having having this text first but uh, the, what do you like about this text? Like, what motivated you to do do a new translation? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, for one thing, I I, I love Arthur. Uh, I love Arthuriana, um, and uh, I read part of this text when I was in undergraduate. Probably, um, I I did courses on medieval Latin. As as I progressed in my Latin education, I got more interested in um, texts from late antiquity, and then. Uh, the middle ages and, uh, inter early modern period and stuff. But, um, uh, so I w had already read part of it and I was interested and I wanted to know more. I had never read the whole thing in Latin, uh, up until, uh, doing this project. And also I was kind of just looking for content for my Patreon. I was like, this is something I could do. Uh, it would help me keep my Latin sharp also. Right. I'm not, I'm not teaching as much as I used to. Um, so it's like I can I can keep my Latin sharp. I can have content a couple days a week on the Patreon. And then when I'm done, I'll have a book that I did. And it, and there are, you know, translations uh, of this text available. It's an important text. So, of course, it's available. You know, Oxford's got one, I'm sure. Uh, Penguin's got one, whatever. Um, but I also kind of wanted, like, let's do one that's um, really accessible, uh, really readable, um, modern, casual English. Um, and then uh, conversational style footnotes rather than um, any like impenetrable academic talk, right? I wanted, uh, so the, like the subtitle I put on my uh, title page in the, just in the PDF, I don't know if it'll be in the print version, but I called it a translation for normal people because that, I mean, that's the idea, right? This isn't for academics. It's for people who are curious about Arthur. They're curious about British legends. Um, 
and they want to know, but they don't want to have to wade through really thick prose, you know, and then footnotes that don't make sense to uh, general audiences, you know. And uh, so that is what I did. Um, I, I tried to put it together, and my number one goal is uh, readability um, over any kind of style or anything like that. Um, I just wanted to make this material really accessible. Um, and I, I hope I've done that. Yeah, I, I would say you definitely have. And, and the footnotes are, because, you know, I have read this text before, but, but they really are enlightening. But, but as you said, that they're, they're, also, they're also a lot of fun. So, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, there's, there's a light humorous touch, some great commentary on the text in the footnotes, as well as uh, uh, needed information. Um, so we're mostly going to be talking about the Arthur section, but are there some other scenes and sections of the book that are faves of yours? Oh, sure. I mean, um, yeah, like I said, there there are some uh, sections that are more amplified than others, like uh, the, the section on, so the the founding of, of Britain, uh, this is this is another major, probably the after Arthur, the most significant uh, portion of the text is the story of Brutus of Troy, which is book one. Um, Jeffrey contends that uh, Britain is named after this guy, Brutus, right? It's called Britain because it was founded by Brutus, and he's a descendant of Aeneas, the founder of the of the Romans, and he has to flee um, Alba Longa, which is the city that the Trojans uh, founded before they went to Rome, and he he has to flee for reasons. And he, in kind of a miniature Aeneid of his own, or Odyssey, if you want to think of it that way, has to kind of uh, sail around and find his way to the island of Britain, where he um, you know founds this new nation and he makes new allies along the way. And all of this stuff is done for the purposes of uh, etiologies and um, giving the origins of names of the areas, right? So he's Brutus, but then he meets Corineus, who Corineus becomes the founder of Cornwall. And uh, so we get explanations for it. He has three sons, and after and it's after his sons that uh, Scotland... Um, I forget what the other ones are. Uh, Logris, which is what uh, England is called before it's called England. And... Uh, Cambria, oh yeah, Cambria, which is Wales, um, and all so Albany is what they called Scotland before the Scots came in. Um, so he has those sons. So it's all, it's all, um, yeah, it's e- ideological, but also there are giants in it. Um, Corneas famously can wrestle giants to the ground by himself, and uh, so all that stuff is really cool. I like that. Uh, then there's also um, the early version of the King Lear story um, that Shakespeare famously adapts it goes differently the setup is the same the outcome is <laughs> is different um so you know the the idea of a king who has three daughters and he has to figure out who he's leaving his kingdom to so he asks them to flatter him basically and he punishes the one who refuses to flatter him just for flattery's sake and uh so the story continues from there and it does it doesn't end up the same way <laughs> as in shakespeare but um but that stuff is there uh and then there's plenty of like little uh just like uh, almost like just thrown off quickly. It's like, oh yeah, this king uh, studied magic and so he made these magical healing baths. That's the city of Bath. Also, he could fly until he couldn't fly anymore and he fell and he died when he crashed on top of the temple of Apollo. Uh, so you just get like little paragraph stuff like that, which is uh, really neat. But yeah, you get all sorts of little kind of flavors of different things. And it, and it's all, you know, it's all legendary. Don't take this as a history, right? Um, it's almost all mythological or legendary he does incorporate elements of history and that's what makes it really uh tricky and that's where the footnotes really have to come in where i I, i'm trying to untangle what really happened because the real history is primarily the sections from the roman period when the romans take over britain and and he still confuses a lot of stuff and and um you know he's like well you know constantine was from britain well no he wasn't (laughs) but uh but that plays into an existing legend about Constantine's mother, um, you know, Helen being uh, British, being the daughter of King Cole, who was maybe the old King Cole, the merry old soul, but may, probably not. Uh, some people say that that those are connected, but probably not. But um, so there's all, all sorts of little um, stuff like that outside of the Arthur stuff that um, is interesting and fun. Uh, yeah, weird little bits with monsters and talking animals and... Uh, and then you, and then just random Caesar has a magic sword. That's cool. That you didn't read about that elsewhere. He's got a sword called the yellow death. That's pretty sick. <laughs> uh, 
So, you know, lots of, lots of cool stuff scattered throughout, even outside of uh, the Arthur stuff. Yeah. And uh, Jason, I think you have a question here next. Yeah, well, uh, a bit, bit tongue-in-cheek, but um, as I was kind of going through everything, I'm like, Conan, this Conan guy keeps popping up. <laughs> is I mean, is there anything, like, this is a, a bit of a segue from specifically your project, but is there any relationship between that Conan and the Barbarian we know, like, through a Robert E. Howard appreciation for this text or anything like that? Uh, I don't know if it's specifically this text, but... Um... The, the Conan that's featured in, I mean, there's a number of guys named Conan featured in this text, but the, the, the main the main Conan that's in this text is Conan Meriadoc, who uh, is a major um, legendary figure for um, Brittany, right? The, the Celtic colony in, uh, in France. And mm. uh, so that name is very much associated with that area. And there are a number of legendary heroes with that name. So I'm not a, I'm not a Howard scholar or anything, but I suspect that he just kind of took this name that's so prevalent in Northern European legend and just mm-hmm. borrowed it from that. I, I, I don't know enough about, I haven't read enough Howard to know if he would have been familiar with this text. My guess is he just saw, I mean, he wouldn't have to be because like I said, there's a, a number of, um, you know, Breton and other Celtic legends that feature guys with the name Conan. So, oh, man. yeah, yeah, no, it was mostly tongue in cheek, but it, there is also like Robert uh, Howard's whole like thing was to try to do um, sort of a pseudo lost history, you know, like the yeah, for sure. all of the stuff in Conan is like pre history. So, you know, um, uh, I, I've always appreciated that, like, that allows him to kind of just take names from wherever he wants and. And yeah, so for sure. Kind of like... Yeah, yeah. I, I I have read enough to know that yeah, he's doing a pseudo history where it's a it's a prehistorical society that has echoes of a medieval society, but he's able to yeah, he's able then to pick and choose geographically and from different time periods, mm-hmm. um, and just use whatever he wants, which is cool. I you know, no one should be beholden to reality if you're writing a fantasy story, right? Do whatever you want. Exactly. Yeah. And I, the, I, I do also, also kind of want to go back to something John mentioned earlier about like, um, uh, how does it connect to Gnosticism? Like, uh, other like listeners and watchers may know about our ep- other episodes of Pop Gnosis, where we're like, we're looking at movies that probably aren't ever intended to be Gnostic, and finding a Gnostic connection. And like, I'm already thinking about some Gnostic stuff that we'll get into later, here in this text. But it's like, just because Jeffrey might not have been trying to, you know, propagate a Gnostic myth, doesn't mean we can't find some find the Gnostic genre inside it <laughs> sure. you know, just to yeah. kind of hang, hang that all over the conversation as well. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. John, did you want to get back into anything there? Oh yeah. No, not really. I, I can just keep uh, 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 tramping along, which is uh, uh, Benito, you already mentioned that, that you're aiming for a very readable translation. And, you know, I have a few quotes here uh, of, of your prose, <laughs> uh, which is uh, <laughs> some people can have a sense of it, but we have phrases like, why are you stepping to me? You idiot. For as Apuleius asserts concerning the god of Socrates, between the moon and the earth live evil and unclean spirits, which they call incubus demons. They have a nature that's partly human, partly angelic, and when they do so desire, they can hu- assume human shape and get busy of ladies. Merlin then turns to the wizards and says, Tell me, you lying bozos, if you know what lies beneath the swamp. With two different works weighing on me, I should half-ass two things instead of half-assing one thing. And so the king stayed there that night with Ygrain and knocked the boots he had so long desired. Um, that that said, there is of course some really beautiful <laughs> turns of phrase in there, right? Some real some uh, some real uh, poetry. But but I'm just wondering, is 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 the Latin that raw? Is it very close? And like, are the colloquialisms coming from from the text, and are other people just kind of more fussily translating them? Because you know, I probably first read this in a you know a, a free uh, the public domain Latin translation that's pretty stuffy, right? And I know sometimes there could be some some pretty raw stuff in other languages that more delicate sensibilities toned down. So I'm wondering, are, are you actually echoing what, what it's like to read it in the Latin with, with your more readable translation? Uh, uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, so, some of the more really idiomatic and really colloquial stuff uh, was to amuse myself uh, while I was doing this. And a lot of it pr- probably won't make it to the print version. Um, I, I'm, I, the print version will keep the, the casual accessible tone but the more distracting stuff, like some of the examples <laughs> that you read, uh, are are available in the PDF because the P- the PDF is the pure Patreon version with all this some all the silliness in it. 
Um, the more permanent uh, print edition <laughs> will have some revisions where I take out just the stuff, just the stuff that's more uh, distracting. I would say that these translations are uh, defensible from a uh, <laughs> from the standpoint of uh, the meaning. I'm not stretching the meaning. Uh, I am playing with the tone a little bit. Uh, his, uh, you know, Jeffrey's uh, prose is fairly straightforward, um, and so uh, so sometimes sometimes I add stuff like that just uh, so I'm not being as repetitive as he is uh, with. Um, the actual, you know, vocabulary. He'll he'll use the same words over and over again, and so sometimes I try to add a little bit of um, variety by by choosing things. And uh, you know, sometimes I'll throw in, you know, you euf euphemisms uh, and such. But um, yeah, some of that stuff is just for me. <laughs> Honestly, uh, has it made me light? I think uh, I think that is. Uh... I, I'd consider leaving it in, you know, in the print version. Yeah, because some, you should. You some should. Of it, some like, of it will definitely stay. Some of it will definitely yeah. stay. But there, there are ones that I think are distracting, and that's that's the stuff. Like I don't, I don't want to take someone out of it. Um, it yeah. You know, if it, if yeah. it's something that's fun, that's one thing. But if it's something that will make someone go, well, yeah, you know, I don't really want. I don't want that. So no, that, uh, that that's fair. I think like what what is nice is. Um, uh, like sort of by by shaking up the stuffiness the jet like John was pointing out there it does actually like let it live a little more like rather than feeling like it has to be behind glass and, and yeah for sure you know like yeah so yeah I mean I think um, that's I think that's an important point because this was this was a popular text right like this wasn't meant for academic study this was a thing that people yeah. were reading right it's it's mm -hmm. supposed to be readable and so I I think the distance that's added by you know, an old-fashioned English prose, or you know, a more um, straightforward uh, translation, I th I think loses the fact that this was supposed to be readable and it was supposed to be kind of breezy and fun, um, mm. and it and it was yeah, it was popular literature. It wasn't meant to be, you know, hard. It wasn't supposed to be hard to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to ask about that. Oh, um. In terms of like uh, its writing, the, the the writing style and even like the writing intent, and I mean, you might have touched on this before, but like other folks have taken the taken this text as history. Mm, oh, for was sure. was Jeffrey writing it as history? Like, did did he think he was writing history, or did he think he was like interpreting history? If if that makes uh, sense, uh, you um, know, you know, hard to hard to say. He definitely, you know, he had his. Um, you know, he had his motivations. He had his own um, motives, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he ha he knew he clearly knew how much he was inventing. But I do think, you know, I feel like he felt probably he was being true to the spirit of the history. He, I mean, he does, um, you know, he uses the best sources he can find, and and a lot of times he'll take borrow whole hog from. Uh, more reliable um, historical witnesses um, like Gildas. And, um, but a lot of times, even then, he will transform that material to fit his own narrative better. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he certainly knew that he was manipulating the material. He knew he was inventing things. But at the same time, I feel like he was, I don't know, try, do, doing his best to create a more or less cohesive narrative, which I think was perhaps more interesting to him than reliably reporting um, the actual history, which is fair. I under I, I understand that same impulse. I have it as well. <laughs> it, it it also like it goes back to what I was saying there about seeing when I talk about Gnosticism as a genre, it's like sort of or even Gnosticism as like a literary theory approach. Like you know you can analyze something from say you know. Um, uh, semiotics theory or from like socialist theory or from all like all different kinds of ways of examining any given text is that uh, when you know something has been has had a creative lens put upon it then I think it allows a more it allows a more like a genre based approach to examining it. and that's so so like when some of the things that I'm thinking about Gnostically about this text it feels like it's it's maybe more appropriate if I know he knows he's creating it if that makes sense sure um, yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, kind of a bit of a segue there, but uh, oh, it's a yeah. show for segues. So, <laughs> exactly. um, so uh, you know, uh, uh, the 
And Jason mentioned uh, Conan. Um, like the the text is kind of. I, I was also saying before the show to to um, to Jason that it, it's uh, it's kind of like if um, if guts from Berserk uh, was was King Arthur or if Conan was King Arthur because it's it's really violent. So like when you're talking about it being like consumption for normal people, it's 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 an action movie as opposed to say like the highly literate, symbolical, and intricate Morte Arthur and and some of the other romances. Or the other comparison I had, it's the first year of action comics, which I love, by the way, the great reading, but versus, say, All-Star Superman. But but I find the text has its own charm, but it's really violent. Like, Arthur loves killing. Like, he tries yeah. attempted <laughs> genocide of uh, the Scots and the Fix. And, like, the text even says he, he wants, he's, he intends to go in to kill every one of them. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of detail in each battle, right? Like, Jeffrey really... Again, he, he's very much a dude, right? He's, uh, folks, if you love action movies and action comics, you Jeffrey's your man because, you know, he loves, like, some of the intricate battles and, you know, the formations. And when it comes to one, uh, one-to-one one combat, you know, it's it's blow by blow. Uh, again, for a berserk comparison, that there's there's, there's a number of times some, some swords strike some heads in half. Um, can you tell us a little <laughs> yeah, bit about, yeah, about pe- the vibe? People do be getting cut in half in this one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, there's definitely there is um yeah, the violence can get uh pretty detailed. Uh there's a lot of times where it's you know, it's it's the heat of pitched battle and it'll just be like much blood was shed on both sides, right? He'll say that. But yeah, a lot of times when it's single combat, um, you see a lot of specific things. Uh he'll he, he mentions, yeah, uh, you know, there's uh yeah, there's definitely a bit where Gawain cuts a guy in half. Uh you get that. Um is is pretty good. Uh yeah, there's a lot of blood, um, and yeah, it's just it's it's um, it's a rawer text than the more polished, um, courtly romances that come later, right? He's got, um, you know, this is still this is pre chivalry, arguably, right? So he's interested in he's interested in things um, different from the later romance writers who want to present this a kind of honorable. Um, idea right so it's it's kind of a middle step between the pure warlord of the earlier texts and then the yeah the more you know courtly and chivalrous arthur later so um and yeah and i think it just plays to the fact that like i said you know this is a text meant for popular consumption so it gives the people what they want and what they want is romans getting cut in half so <laughs> yeah uh- you mentioned Merlin and the Book of Merlin, which is its its own thing within this this text, and it's actually the beginnings of this text, even though it's in the middle. But can you tell us about Merlin in the book and what might surprise uh, a lot of people who are familiar with the Arthurian uh, uh, mythos uh, uh, with Merlin here? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Geoffrey of Monmouth essentially invented Merlin. Um, he he had sources. He um, but uh, but Geoffrey's Merlin, the Merlin that we know, um, is a composite figure of um a guy named uh Merv and then also um Ambrosius who is a char- Ambrosius is a character in this but a lot of his attributes get uh, transferred over to um Merlin and his name becomes Merlin Ambrosius right as a result um and sorry did you say Merv was one of the early names Mer- Mer- Merv M M Y R D D D Merv okay. uh Merv <laughs> and and Merv. so and so actually so a Jeff, one of the things that Jeffrey did is he created the name Merlin as his transliteration of Merv. The more straightforward one would have been Merdin, right? Instead of Mer- instead of Merlin, but um, in Latin it's Merlinus, right? Is is Merlin just Merlin with U.S. at the end? But if he had kept it M E R D I N N U S, Merdinus, um, that means um, shitty guy, right? And so. <laughs> That's uh, he didn't want to call him that. Uh, so, the the generally accepted idea is that he changed he changed the D to an L so that his name didn't mean that in Latin. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, he invents the name. He more or less creates the figure based on you know a Welsh um, prophet and bard plus a um, uh, a Brythonic kind of uh, legendary hero. Um, and yeah, he combines attributes of both, makes his own uh, prophet, wizard, and uh, yeah, he. So in addition to this text, we only have a couple of things by Geoffrey of Monmouth, and we don't know much about him outside of his writing. So this is the big, big one, 
But he had the Prophecies of Merlin, which was a separate text that got integrated into this one. But he also did a poem uh, called The Life of Merlin, um, which uh, features more Merlin stuff. And you get a lot more, um, uh, you get Morgan Le Fay in that, who is hmm. not not in this one. But Morgan Le Fay is a character in, in The Life of Merlin. And uh, so, yeah, without Jeffrey Monmouth, we would not have Merlin at all. And um, so in addition to his prophecies, which, like I said, were very um, influential throughout the Middle Ages and taken very seriously as prophecy. Um, also, he is a major player in a couple of books of the text, right? His, the most famous thing, and this is him co-opting, uh, this is this is Jeffrey co-opting a, um, a legend about Ambrosius, uh, um, where uh, Vortigern, the king Vortigern, is trying to build a tower. The tower keeps collapsing and uh, he can't figure out why. And Merlin says, well, it's because there's two dragons fighting underneath the foundation. Um, and one dragon represents the Britons and one dragon represents the Saxons and this and that. And that's what, and then from there he expands into his much larger prophecy. Um, but uh, there's that. And then he helps out uh, Ambrosius and then later um, Uther Pendragon. Um, but like you were saying, readers might be surprised that after the birth of Arthur, Merlin disappears from the text. He's no longer in the text. Like I, at, um, modern readers expect, I mean, they're more familiar with things like the sword and the stone, um, TH white and, and Merlin's role does get expanded in, you know, legitimate medieval, um, and early modern, uh, Arthuriana. So it, it's not, so like TH white is not just making all that stuff up. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he disappears after helping, with the conception of Arthur in, in this text. And so we don't see him as the tutor of Arthur. We don't see him um, helping with any of that stuff that you might expect. Um, he, he helps Arthur be born and then that's it. Um, you know, it's, it's only in later traditions that uh, Merlin takes Arthur um, from Tintagel and gives him to be fostered by Sir Ector and all that stuff that um, people are familiar with um, mm. from Mallory or, uh, white or Disney. It's a. Uh, it's interesting how you said that even there though, like T. H. White didn't didn't uh, make it up. But on the other hand, we're talking about a figure that is like probably at least half made up anyway. <laughs> you know, like or a conglomeration. Right. Of yeah, yeah. Together, you know. Oh, I think well, that's, for sure. Yeah, um, and I'm not I'm not criticizing you, what you're saying there. I think it just it's an interesting way of 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 the way of thinking about this stuff that like, it's it's uh, like everybody's doing a variation, but they but they are varying it off of something that's an interesting element of yeah and you know like of transference yeah and i mean there's i mean we're talking dozens of variations of these stories across different countries different languages many different centuries and people are drawing from different sources and they're drawing upon different motivations right so you know uh so jeffrey has his motivations mallory has his own th white writing in the 20th century has his own things that he wants to say about fascism um and uh, the use of power and that kind of stuff in, in a way that Jeffrey and Mallory wouldn't have thought of. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, and of course, uh, you know, T.H. White had no inhibitions whatsoever about incorporating anachronism and colloquialism and, and jokes and goofs into his text, which is part of why it's, I, I think it's so successful. But um, yeah. yeah, he's absolutely putting a 20th century spin on this material while, while still being pretty faithful to Mallory as source material. Yeah. And, and we can't also ignore, um, uh, Camelot 3000 by, uh, what is it? Mike O'Barr and Brian Bolland. <laughs> um, you know, also Brian with, Bolland, a, yeah. with a, yeah, yeah a, a different spin on it as well. I'm, um, yeah, just yeah. that, again, that notion of like all of these inherited elements. Um, sorry, John, you're, you, I think, oh, I think, I think I, you're going to rein me in. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say Kieran Gillen come on the show and talk about once in the future. So <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a good... a, uh, yes, that just occurred to me. And, and that's definitely, I didn't even think about it when I was saying it, but that's exactly what the, that's the conceit of that book, right? Once in future, a, a beautiful comic, Kieran Gillen and Dan Mora, if you haven't read it and you like King Arthur, you absolutely should. But of, over the course of that series, there are multiple Arthurs that come up and they ha and they bring their own uh kind of things with them right you mm. there's there's uh there's the welsh arthur of the welsh triads and such and then you've got 
then you've got a more um, Mallory style Arthur, and then eventually you've got a, a, a Tennyson style Arthur who ha who brings Victorian values with him. And mm -hmm. um, so he's definitely looking at the way that um, these legends are, uh, yeah, that, that there's a cycle to them, but that they're brought back in new contexts with new motivations to express new ideas. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's absolutely what's at the core of that series, which is uh, really good that I h highly recommend. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so the, uh, uh, what was I going to ask there? It, like we were saying earlier that this is sort of pre-chivalric as we, as we think of that term, but it's like, is this setting the foundation of what, of uh, like the, the legends that then make people think like w want to make chivalry a thing. I don't know if what I'm saying makes I, sense. I, you know? I, I don't, I don't want to commit to any firm answer on that before. Because that uh, uh, is an a medie an actual medieval historian will um, stomp me into pace probably. Um, so I, I not only being very violent. <laughs> I, I only tentatively say that that this is pre chivalry because it may not. Be. I mean, we're already looking at the 12th century. We're definitely high Middle Ages. So I don't know. I don't know. My my answer to that is I don't I don't know, and I'm definitely not going to commit to anything. Someone smarter than me should should answer that question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, time in the comments. Um, yeah. So, uh, so we talked about kind of Merlin disappearing, not in a magician way, but uh, what what are some other things missing, quote unquote, that might surprise people who are familiar with Arthur and are going to this text? Yeah. I mean, I feel like if you were to ask people probably to like list the top five, ten things they know about Arthur, uh, a lot of them that they say would not be in this text, right? Uh, the Holy Grail, not not there. Uh, Lancelot. Not there. He's French, um, so he he comes later. Um, most, I mean, most of the uh, most of the knights of the Round Table, are not there. The I mean, the Round Table's not there. <laughs> uh, um, the and of course, since Lancelot's there, the the love triangle with Lancelot and Guinevere also not there. Um, Merlin training Arthur as a young boy is not there. Um, but then there are things that you might surprise to might be surprised to see there. Um, Excalibur is there. Um, the Sword in the Stone is not there. Ex Excalibur is, but he doesn't draw the Sword in the Stone. Uh, as, as questionable as it is. Oh, we um, may have. Oh, may yeah, have I don't know. A little uh, bit of that there, Benito. Oh yeah, you froze for a sec. Uh, I think after the uh, Sword in the Stone okay. is the last thing we. Um, we got. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I was just saying that. Uh, yeah, there's no sword in the stone, uh, but there is Excalibur. Are those the same sword? Hard to tell. But there's no there's no Arthur becoming king by drawing the sword from the stone. But he does have a sword called Excalibur, that is magic. Um, so that that part is there. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not forgetting. What else do people expect from a, a King Arthur story? Uh, Grail. I don't know. Yeah. yeah holy, yeah. So there's no there's no Holy Grail. Most of most of those knights that you expect with the Grail um, cycle of legends are not there. So there's no la uh, there's no Lancelot, there's no Galahad, no Percival. Really, the only knights uh, that are there that people would know um, are Kay and Gawain and Bedivere. Those are those are the only ones. Um, I and that's another thing about my approach uh, to this translation is um, I try to use the familiar forms of the names. Um, so that people aren't constantly having to flip back and go, wait, who's this guy? Who's who's Walganus? Right. I don't want people to go, who's Walganus? And instead, I just write Gawain, right? Yeah. Mm. Because they know who Gawain is. And so, because it's supposed to be about readability, I do use um, as often as possible the the more familiar forms of names, if if the characters are known at all, you know. So I use I use the more familiar spelling of Lear when I talk about King Lear, L-E-A-R instead of L-E-I-R and so on. Um, just because yeah. I would, uh, it, that, I mean, that, that was, a, that was, a, um, a choice that I kind of went back and forth on. Cause I was like, do I want people, I, do I want these things to feel familiar or do I want to defamiliarize these things because people are seeing them in this context for the first time. But I ultimately decided that for the sake of readability where they where they people are not having to constantly stop and like translate in their heads you know mm -hmm. who's this person who's who's Gaius oh Gaius is Sir Kay okay you know like that so yeah 
it uh, and it also does like allow people to see it, to see it as part of that greater tradition, like the then maybe the names we know better, but coming from the the place that a lot of these they first started from, kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, uh, just when you said Gawain, we did an episode about uh, the Green Knight movie that came out a while ago. Um, uh, is is that yeah. in this at all? Is the the Green Knight? Does the Green Knight exist in this? No, or? definitely not. Okay. <laughs> no, um, I that would be cool. No, that's definitely um, relatively late in in the um, in the cycle of stuff, right? Uh, we do get Arthur uh, killing a giant. Uh, the giant of uh, Mont Saint Michel. That's that. So that's an early that that becomes a a pretty early one that actually has probably I would say fallen out of most traditions. You don't hear about that one very often. It is. I know it is in. Uh, it's in Bullfinch. I know Bullfinch has it, but I think a lot of other um, collections of Arthur stories don't don't have him fighting the the giant of uh, Saint Michael's Mount. Hmm. But uh, it is it is in this one. Um, it's and it's you know it's a pretty cool one. Another another bloody and detailed single combat fight. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it is it it does bring in that sense of um, the supernatural. I guess Merlin also brings in that sense of the supernatural. <laughs> There's also the a, a black cat just crossed the camera, so that's another supernatural moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there are definitely elements of the supernatural in this, right? Like I for one thing like i said he's he's not trying for pure historiography um but also you know he probably believed in some element of uh of you know the supernatural and so um yeah we we do get giants we do get yeah merlin besides prophesying does other magic um like i said caesar has got a magic sword excalibur is a magic sword um mm-hmm. there are giants here and there um there, you know, the there's a prophecy coming from the the pagan gods at, in the pre-Christian era. Um, mm. So yeah, there there are definitely um, magical elements throughout uh, the text. In, yeah. in, in, in between him talking about actual, you know, like Roman bureaucracy and stuff like that. <laughs> hey, I'm uh, talking about the Romans. Uh, I suppose that might surprise people, and I'm I'm surprised it didn't uh, surprise contemporary readers of the text. Is uh, Arthur conquers the Roman Empire and most of Europe? Like, did nobody read this and not notice that that Britain never did that? And even though they are mentioned and appear in the book, are, are figures like uh, like Constantine, who you mentioned, or Emperor Magnus Maximus, are, are these influences on, on this idea that 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 Arthur conquered the Roman Empire? Uh, I mean, yeah, yes. Uh, he, I'm, <laughs> so, so well, you you say like, well, how, why didn't they notice that that never happened? Uh, it's like, where else were they going to find out about that? Uh, but but also, technically, he does conquer the Roman Empire, but he's not able to rule there because he has to go back to Britain because uh, because his nephew Mordred has uh, stolen the throne and married his wife Guinevere while he was gone. Um, so he has to go back. So, so it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a having and eating his cake, uh, because he can, (laughs) he can have Arthur be the conqueror of the world, but also not the ruler of the world in order, because that would be easy to prove wrong. Um, but it's also probably worth noting that there wasn't really, by this point, there wasn't a Roman empire in the West. Um, and so he's, uh, this is definitely him playing with stuff he's he's inventing ruler and he's not even consistent about like is this guy the emperor is this guy some kind of proconsul uh what is he and he you know he mentions an emperor leo emperor leo is in is in constantinople he's not at rome um so i mean obviously the eastern empire continues on for another thousand years but uh in the west we've got a whole mess of germans trying to figure out what's going on at this point uh and so the idea that Arthur comes down into the continent and conquers Gaul, makes his way into Italy, conquers Italy, and is prepared to sit on the, the throne of Rome. Uh, pure fantasy. But yeah, it de- definitely there are certain um, there are certain Roman emperors that lived large in the Brythonic imagination, including, yeah, Constantine and Magnus Maximus. Um, you can even see, um, you know, there's a story about Magnus Maximus in uh, the Mabinogian, the the um collection of of welsh uh, mythology and so uh 
yeah, these these people were in the idea space. And so um, this is the kind of stuff, you know, Jeffrey's like, I've got, got to incorporate this, got to make this stuff that people already know kind of central in some ways. And so, yeah, he but he does go to some considerable lengths to tie um, the throne of Britain with uh, Imperial Rome. He, he makes a whole line of uh, Roman emperors, British, who were not... <laughs> <laughs> but but who but who had who probably had some connection to Britain in terms of uh, campaigning there um, militarily. Um, a number of the kings that he lists as kings of Britain were that were also uh, Roman emperors were usurpers, right? They were pretenders um, who were in maybe northern Gaul or something like that, who were of Celtic and ancestry and declared themselves emperor. So are are they really the emperor? Were they really the king of Britain and the answer and, well the answer to that the second question is the answer to both questions is no but um because there was no <laughs> there was no king of there was no king of the Britons right that that whole idea is a fantasy right the idea of Arthur as king of all Britain and anyone before him as king of all Britain pure fantasy right the the Britons were as most of the Celts were uh, including the Gauls right I should probably the 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 Britons who the people who inhabit the island of Great Britain at this time are Celtic people. Um, the Celts, we, and now we associate the Celts primarily with um, the extreme parts of the British Isles, the Scotland, Ireland, and uh, Isle of Man, and, and so on. But like the Celts are originally from central Eurasia, right? And then they, they spread throughout. And uh, so they go to the Iberian Peninsula. They go through, And so when we talk about Gauls, like Caesar conquering the Gauls, those are Celts as well. Um, and, uh, so, um, I lost the thread of what I was saying, uh, uh, but, oh yeah, but uh, uh, so, so all these Cel all the Celts and Gauls are loosely associated conglomerates of tribes, right? They're individual tribes. If you read Caesar, they'll talk about the Gauls as if they're a people, but they're a lot of tribes, many of whom hated each other, which of course Caesar uses to his advantage, right? He's able to, mm -hmm. um, he's able to play up alliances in a way that helps him take over the more the ones who are causing him trouble and um so yeah there was no king of the britons because the britons were not a unified uh nation they were it, it was just tribe 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 so there would have been all sorts of petty kings and uh chieftains and stuff like that throughout the island and, and so a number of those uh figures are the ones who in jeffrey get elevated to the position of of king of all the britons you know is this is this also kind of like, because, uh, you know, he um, references Virgil or Aeneas rather and Brutus as this like, you know, tr try to create this like chain of lineage to go back to Aeneas. And like um, Virgil was using Aeneas because Homer used uh, like, you know, had the, had the Iliad kind of thing. Is that like, could this be seen in that sort of um, uh, national epic or like, you know, uh, um creating a, a national myth using through, following that epic chain of association, like between epic myth. I absolutely, I would say so. I mean, it, t technically genre wise, this isn't, is not an epic as it's not poetry and this and that, but like, but yes, mm. the, I, I think he's absolutely trying to create a continuity um, there. And of, and of course, I mean, he, he's also trying to, he's really trying to, one, one of his main motives is to create a chain of legitimacy from the Roman empire and even to the, full foundations of Rome to the British throne, right? And, and the people of Britain, because, you know, he's ultimately his message is, is anti-Saxon in a lot of ways, even though he was probably a Norman himself. Uh, uh, never the, nevertheless, right. He, he, he's, he's fully kind of like, um, he's, he's idealizing um, th these ancient Britons in a way. And he, t he talks about, I mean, once you get kind of get to the end, he's like the the great the great British people of of long past have gone. You know, they've um, degenerated. They've uh, they became decadent. They were they lost all their nobility, and now they're just Welsh. And that's kind of that's kind of the <laughs> the downer note that uh, the book ends on. He's like, once we were we used to be a real country, now we're just Welsh, uh, and that's. Uh, that's kind of the note he he ends on. So, 
Yeah, he's really tr he's trying to absolutely tie the British throne to these grand mythological ideas in that same tradition. Um, Virgil and Homer, yeah, for sure. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, the time to wrap up. But uh, again, the, we'll do the commercial for uh, patreon.com slash Benito Serino. Uh, as he mentioned, he, he updates almost obsessively multiple times per week. But if you also want to give money to a Patreon that doesn't, go to patreon.com slash Gnostic. Uh, for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can help the show going. Uh, we don't really give you anything. So we didn't. We don't want to put anything behind a paywall. But we uh, we do give you early access to the shows. Uh, the support we've had so far is, is allowing us to do more shows. We're hoping to get up to eight per month. You know, the, the, the two a week. Uh, the, everybody needs more podcasts. There's barely any. You know, if you go searching on a, on a podcatcher or on YouTube, you know, there's no content out there. So we want to we wanna fix that. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.be slash Gnostic. Uh, so thanks again, Danita. That, that was really awesome. Thank you so much for having me back on. I, I always love talking to you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do more. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you.